This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Hello again. Welcome to uh, Episode 6 of the podcast. On this show, we're starting off the, the discussion with a clip from the interview of Red Badge Takwerda, who is a Dutch coach. Um, he's won six league, six cup, and six super cup titles with uh, men's teams in his native country. He's been voted or uh, selected as Dutch Volleyball Coach of the Year. Uh, he's also coached in the CEV Champions League, the CEV Cup, and the CEV Challenge Cup at the club level. And has also coached in the European League, in the European Championships with the Dutch national team. Um, the specific clip that you'll hear in a moment uh, has to do with the question of the importance of being a teacher uh, during training versus being a coach on match day. We, we go into a couple of different um, perspectives on this. Red Bat has his own view. Um, and Mark brings in the uh, discussion of uh, human McCutcheon. And so overall, the conversation kind of spins around where the values come from, where the strengths and weaknesses of, of coaches uh, may or may not lie, the importance of, of each type of, uh, of role, because most of us have to have both roles. So it ends up um, being a really interesting discussion of, uh, of where we need to exert our energies and, and where our value is as a, as a coach. Uh, so I think you'll like it. Which, is, which part is more important for the work during the week or the work during the match? Um, if you have a very bad trainer who is a very good coach, yes. I, think the, I think the power of the players is bigger than the power of the coach. Okay. So the the coach can spoil the match, and uh, he can add only two percent, mm -hmm. but he can spoil twenty to thirty percent of the match. Yeah. And so, in my opinion, uh, the major work should be done when we play. Okay. And if you spoil it in this moment, it's no use at all what you did in the whole week. There were lots of really, really interesting things from Red Bud's interview. He went in, in lots of directions that are uh, a little bit different, a little bit maybe unusual. Um, but I really like this question, this answer uh, about gameplay versus practice or where the, the strengths of the coach uh, should lie. And, and the background uh, for this question from, from my side is, uh, uh, an interview that I uh, wrote about on my my blog with Hugh McCutcheon where um, he talked about the advantages and disadvantages of the, the US full-time system uh, compared with the European club system and he was talking from a coach's perspective and he, he said that uh, if you're working in the full-time environment, you get better at teaching, and teaching is the critical component of the job. And if you have to choose between teaching and coaching, i.e. working in the game, then it's better to be a better teacher than a coach. And, and that was the background, and that's why I asked the question. And Redbird's answer was interesting in a couple of parts, the first one being that he talked about success in the game as being as showing a player that he's improving. So um, it, he said that if you could, uh, if you can, you can improve a player, but if he doesn't see the results in the games on the weekend, i.e., through the successful result, then he doesn't see his improvement, um, which is a really important uh, idea. And, and the, the second part that he talked about was uh, coaching during practice, the, the idea that uh, it's not just uh, uh, technical feedback, but in practice you're teaching the player how to play. Uh, and I found both of those ideas really, really interesting. And it's interesting how 
they those things differ from coach to coach, which he also made the point. Some people are better at, at one thing than others. Yeah, this is something that's come up in, in other interviews as well, and I know Vital talked about it um, for a little bit during his interview. Uh, it's it is interesting that in outside of the U.S., coaches are normally referred to by what would at least be translated to English as trainers, yeah. whereas the term trainer in the U.S. is usually not a coaching position. It's it's normally what uh, Europeans would call physio, um, a, you know, yeah. more medical staff oriented person, because the coach role is assumed to incorporate not just the teaching element, but also the game day element, whereas what we're talking about here, obviously, is is breaking that down, you know, and from the perspective of what he was discussing, that the educational side is the training side, and the, the game day stuff is the coach side, or, or you know, in certain professional sports, like baseball or football, um, not American football, uh, it would be a manager which takes on a, a, a really interesting um, difference in just the perception of, of what a position is. Because I think a lot of people would look at a baseball manager, for example, as more of a team CEO than necessarily a teacher. Whereas you've got coaches under them, um, specialty coaches, and, and, you know, first base coach, infield coach, whatever, who actually handle primarily the teaching aspect of things. I think most volleyball yeah. coaching staffs are not big enough to, to be able to, to go at, at quite that level of detail. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good point. And the, uh, if, if I think back, there's, there's actually a part in the, in the Platonov book where he says something similar to uh, to Redbud about uh, the importance of, of being able to manage the game in terms of keeping the players motivated or keeping players uh, uh, trusting trusting the coach and uh, yeah it's it's really interesting the the different ways a coach is used um, in in different uh, in different contexts in in different sports and the different roles of the coach. Um, yeah, in in football, for example, I guess in European or English football specifically, the coach is uh, someone who works on the track. On the track, <laughs> that's a good Australian uh, Australian phrase, but works in the training ground. And the manager is the one who gets credit for all the work, but actually spends not that much time with the players. It's, uh, right. Yeah, like uh, like Guardiola. I mean, you've you've looked at him a little bit, haven't you? Which one, sorry? Pep Guardiola. Uh, Guardiola. But Guardiola is a guy, uh, he actually spends, from all accounts, he actually spends a lot of time practicing at practice, but he's not the one who runs the practice. So um, I, in his book, the or the book that talks about his first year in Bayern Munich, they... They describe the separation of duties that he organises the practice or plans the practice with the conditioning coach, and the conditioning coach actually runs the practice. And uh, Guardiola is then um, on the sides providing feedback, pulling players out, or, or whatever, but doesn't actually conduct any of the any of the work. And I've actually seen. Some volleyball coaches, not a ton of them, but some, who've taken a similar sort of uh, approach where they've they've certainly been involved in the planning of training, um, yeah. or even in one case they weren't involved in the planning of training, um, but the, it was left to the first assistant coach, the primary assistant coach, to actually run the session. Uh, in one case, I think it was a situation where the head coach clearly saw herself as as kind of a, a manager type mm -hmm. person, and her assistant coach was a very experienced player. Actually, I think it was Ricky Ludies at the time, or yep. Jeff Stork, one of those two guys. Mm -hmm. and he had them run training. Yeah, that, and that's fine. And it, that was it. Kind of goes to the discussion we had in terms of uh, uh, coaching staff um, decisions. Um, that was a case where 
she obviously thought of her strengths as being in one area and found somebody who could cover the other area. Um, and in, in another instance, there was it, was it was more of a developmental thing where the head coach is on his way toward retirement and he's had a long time assistant coach and he basically said, okay, assistant coach, you develop the practice plan, you, you, you know, set it all up, you run the team through it. And in this case, the, the head coach was actually a participant in the, the coaching that went on during the session. He wasn't completely a bystander. But yeah, in, he did direct things as as most head coaches probably do these days. Yeah, I, I actually worked in in one environment where that was exactly like that. The head coach uh, had no direct input uh, initially, at least into practice. The assistant coach organized all of the practice, prepared all of the practice. We had a briefing in the morning what we were going to do that day. And uh, and then the then we went about practice and everybody was, was a coach, was involved. Um, but the, the head coach didn't, didn't either plan nor directed practice. And that particular situation uh, ended up not so well because the um, uh, the the assistant and the head coach had some some conflict uh, when it came to game days. So uh, during matches, the assistant who essentially organised a big part of the the way the team played and etc cetera, etc cetera, um, didn't have the felt he didn't have the input that he should have during game days. So. Uh, that led to some uh, some conflict that was, and eventually resolved the only possible way that it could be resolved. Right. Bye bye. Uh, yeah, and that's that's the way that that it had to be. Yeah, but uh, getting back to the, to the main point about the, the difference between one's role as a trainer and one's role as a coach, it is an interesting thing to try to figure out what aspect of that, assuming that a coach is, has both roles and isn't just either a trainer or a game day coach, uh, which one is seen as the more important? You obviously thinks that the primary work is done in the training gym and that what comes out of that is what you see on match day. And, and while the, the head coach on a match day has some amount of influence on what happens, Obviously, they, they do the lineup, they call the timeouts, they make the subs. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, they call plays, uh, and others not so much. But the, the bulk of the result comes from what happened during training, not just spontaneously based on get decisions made on game day. That's a... Uh... That's the question. That's ultimately the question that we're trying to answer here. I think that uh, which part of it is um, is the most important component of the result. And um, I know that I I've had my time, lots of conversations or some conversations with uh, uh, with people about uh, whether or not I did something in the in the match, and uh, I. I remember one specific occasion where I ex explained to him that the match is actually about 3% of my total work and went through all the things that I did during the week and the lead up to the match that that, that particular person knew nothing about and for the first time actually considered the possibility that uh, we didn't just lob up on the day and and play the game and, and see what happened. Um, I think the the biggest part of it is the things that you do during the week and what I often refer to it, how I refer to it to myself and, and to others as well is that the, the game is the, is the exam for your practice. It's the, it's the test, it's the proof of whether your practice was successful or not. And, um, I think that's the, the bigger, the bigger part of the, uh, of the role, but I've also I also know that the coach can have 
um, a big impact in a in a game to in an individual game, and maybe not as much as people perceive, and I'm sure not as much as people perceive, but uh, coaches do have uh, Im- impact in in particular individual games, and um, I think ultimately we can't ignore either one of the sides of the job, either of the sides of the job. Yeah, I think um, Paolo Cunha made the point that the vast majority of a team's success or failure is going to come from the style of play that they establish, yep. which is obviously a training aspect of things. Um, but to your point about coaches do have an influence, and unfortunately what we get judged on is often what happens on, a game, on game day and not what happens in the training gym where most, as you say, where most of the work is done. And there are questions that get challenged without an understanding of the context of, of how those decisions get made because it, they don't usually happen that day. <laughs> they usually happen because of things that have developed over the course of days, weeks, months um, leading up to any given match or any given point in a match. Uh, mm-hmm. and, Unfortunately, it's not a transparent thing. Sometimes it's not even transparent for us. You know, uh, <laughs> sometimes you, you, you're kind of going off a gut feel uh, based on you know what you're observing. Uh, yes, and that's where um, uh, confirmation bias is uh, can be our friend, where we uh, we remember all the. The wise moves that we made, the the gut feel decisions where we did something essentially inexplicable that worked out, and uh, yes, and forget conveniently the times where we were completely wrong and had no clue what was going on. Yeah, it, it is. It's funny to to kind of look back and evaluate your decisions in a match, and and. The, 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 unfortunately, you don't have the counterfactual. You don't. You can't say, "Well, if I made this other decision, this is what would have happened." Because maybe the same thing would have. The result would have been the same, regardless. In which case, suddenly you feel like you're less important as a coach and less meaningful in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, that's but that's an ego and a pride thing. Uh, for me, it's it, I, my first head coaching experience was one of those situations where it was definitely mainly a coaching thing because the amount of training time that I had was minimal. Uh, yep. just a group of guys that we, we tried out, we, we selected. Actually, selection is a bit of a stretch because we pretty much took everybody because <laughs> there was only a limited number of guys who turned up. Um, yep. uh, we trained once a week for a couple hours for like six sessions, and I don't think I – ever maybe but once or twice at the whole group so training was not a huge part of it and then you know, okay it's you know three-day tournament let's go and I, and I remember going through that tournament thinking to myself especially after I saw kind of the first rounds of matches so I got a good feel of what the competition was like because I had never seen it before okay yeah I had this thought in my head of but you got you got the talent you just can't screw it up somehow <laughs> you gotta make sure Put the guys in a position where they could be successful and don't screw it up. I think that uh, ultimately uh, and sadly for everybody listening, the the coach can do a lot more things to screw things up than to actually improve things. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, we've, we've had the discussion about the, the, the value of a timeout and you've talked about some research about how basically – the, the point immediately following any given timeout is is basically the same odds of winning for the team that took the timeout as if there was any other point in the, in the, in the match. Not basically, exactly the same. Right. So statistically irrelevant. Uh, yeah. I would I would make the case that I'd like to see research on what happens over the next, say, five points. Because generally speaking, I think most of us are motivated to take a timeout in order to try to alter the momentum, and momentum is not a single point sort of thing, but that's that's a discussion for another day. Um, but I, I do agree; it's a, it's a lot easier to mess things up than it is to try to actually improve a situation. And I think that goes back to the whole training 
aspect of it is if you've done your work during the week, then there really isn't a lot that you can do on game day to improve things. It can, you know, you can really only kind of backslide. Yeah. Now, if you haven't done any work during the week, okay, maybe there are things that you can do in a match, you know, scouting observations or whatever, but that's that speaks to preparation. Yep. Yeah, the, there aren't that many things where you can, if you've done preparation, where you can really impact the game. And, um, if you haven't done preparation and you fly by the seat of your pants, then I think the coaching skill is uh, uh, is decisive. But uh, uh, if you do the work during the week, then uh, the number of times that I've been in a game recently, so the last recently seven eight years where the other team's done something that I wasn't ready for uh, or that we hadn't talked about during the week is is pretty I could count them on on fingers of one hand um, some differences in distribution perhaps but uh, there are big differences from distribution from game to game anyway but uh, individual spikers individual servers they're predictable. They fit in with the um, with their patterns, and then you just play the game. It's, are my guys better than your guys? Well, so, okay. We we can actually pull out a recent example of this for you, because yep. during the the last season's German Championships, in the very first match, the opposing team's starting setter went down with an injury that kept them out for the rest of the series. So yep. that's obviously a situation where you've got a new guy, a new distribution, and you and I talked a little bit about it afterwards. Um, is was that something that you had prepared, or was that something you kind of had to say, okay, let's let's this is what we're going to do? My personal experience, and this is a this is a, a big tangent. My personal experience is that over time, if you take distributions over time, they're more or less meaningless. That uh, you can make a few generalizations that this guy's used generally more than that guy or that the first tempo is mainly a one, but you can't really say much that's a value in one individual game. So in terms of distribution, um, I, I think that the differences were essentially zero. What the, the biggest thing that we that I focus on is uh, is reading the uh, reading the setter, watching how he moves, how what he does in specific situations, and that's where we focus our attention. And we hadn't prepared as in that sense as well for the the second setter as for the first setter. So in our first match in the playoff series, there were definitely some. Uh, some issues that we didn't read the setter uh, as well as uh, we would in the next games <laughs> um, or the, the first setter had he not been injured. So the the difference is it, definitely in preparation but not in the statistical sense but in the um, in the being ready to, to read him. And he's a guy that we hadn't played against all season. He came later in the season. So... So we didn't know him. Right. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately for me, in England, um, most of the time, I didn't know what I was preparing for. Uh, yeah. We didn't have a video to watch. We hadn't seen – we'd seen teams the year before or something like that, but there was so much turnover that, yeah. it, you know, especially for the first match, you know, the first time through the rotation, it was basically, okay – we're going to play our game, and then we'll figure out if there are things that we could do or should do to, you know, adjust to try to take advantage of something that they're doing or, or solve a problem that they're they're creating for us. Uh, in some cases, you can. In some cases, you can't. I mean, sometimes the other team is just stronger than you, and they've got one guy who just bombs his jump serve, and you just kind of have to try to get in the way. But there were there were times when we could pick up on a thing and say, okay, we, we want to attack relentlessly in this sort of fashion, 
because yeah. there was an exposure. And and that's in that sort of way, there's the benefit to the coach because the coach is the external observer mm-hmm. who hopefully is taking it all in and can report to the players what they're going to probably struggle to see you know, to a, at least to a, a level because they're focused on their own game. And there there is – there is a, a, a train of thought or a philosophy that the head coach come match day should be focused on the opposition side of the court as opposed to their own side of the court. And maybe you have the assistant coach watching your own side. Um, from your perspective, which side do you end up watching? It depends on the – partly depends on the time of the season. So in the – Preparation period, I, I never watch the other team. I never pay attention to the other team. We never have uh, specific tactics for for an opponent. So during a game, I might talk about blocking a little bit more or less line or uh, serving to this or that target. But um, in the preseason, I only watch us and I only uh, – pay attention to the things that we've been practicing and we've been talking about. During the season where it actually comes down to um, winning and losing, in the past I've, I've followed completely the opponent, so I actually kept track of distributions, in-game distributions myself. Um, but over time I felt that I didn't get a good enough overview of the whole game because I was focused on small details. So uh, in the last year, I've concentrated on uh, not concentrating on anything specific, on um, on on taking in a, a general overview of the game and and then picking out important things as we went as we went along. Um, and uh, that's a, that's a skill that you have to develop. Um, the same as any other skill and it took me a, a little bit of time to get comfortable with that after having spent a lot of time with the, the pen and paper um, but uh, towards the or the second half of the season at least I start to uh, started to feel comfortable working in that way. Yeah, I, I can kind of appreciate that because as an assistant coach I, I was okay with the pen and paper you know, ticking down passing stats or serving stats or whatever. But I've always found as a head coach, I have a really difficult time shifting my concentration between what's going on on the floor and making a mark on my on my notepad or, or, or on my tablet or whatever the case may be. Because to, to your point, I feel like I'm losing aspects of the bigger picture that I feel like I'm supposed to be paying attention to. So it, it, it got to the point very quickly, every time I tried, that I just had to put the thing down and... To a, to a large degree, rely on what I was seeing, and obviously there's limitations to that. We've just kind of talked about it, you know, confidence yeah. bias and, and any number of other things. Um, but I felt like I was getting more information that way. So, in any case, we're we're running short on uh, on our time. So, any final thoughts? Uh, the last thought that I have is is coming back to the original point and of which is more important, uh, the game work or the practice work. And um, Redbird, I think, made two great uh, great comments there. The, the one that the, the game is important because it's where the players feel their improvement or learn about their improvement, which we can't ignore as coaches. The Ultimately, as much as we talk about other things, the the reason that we play, the reason that we keep score is so that we have a chance to win at the end. And I also think the, the it's important to consider that different people have different different coaches have skills in different areas, and um, how we put our staff together should cover all those bases. So if uh, if one coach is uh, is a better game day coach, then uh, he can maybe need to look at an assistant who's uh, better better in practice, and and vice versa. So. As always, the lesson is that volleyball or that coaching is really complicated, complex, and um, lots of competing ideas, lots of competing uh, requirements, and um, 
from day to day. We have to figure out the best balance on all of them. All right, we'll wrap it on that. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.